lot to teach us about power and persistence and proclaiming the good news. You know, I like to say that reading the Bible is like peeling an onion. And you, there's layers upon layers of meaning. So when we first read the story, we can, we can understand this about um, the simple stories of healing. But then we peel back and there's another layer of meaning. So keep in mind that Mark, the gospel writer, wrote these stories about 60 years after Jesus was crucified. So he's writing to people that are Christ followers, Christians, even though they don't use that, that word yet. And it's a combination of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, non-Jewish Christians. So we need to understand that the gospel writer told these stories to help Jewish Christians know that God creates and loves and accepts everyone. Jesus first proclaimed his healing message to the Jews. But these stories illustrate that salvation is also for the non-Jews, or Gentiles as they're called in the Bible. So the Syrophoenician woman in our story is a Gentile from the region of Tyre, and I love your introduction. Yes, these, these cities still exist today um, in Lebanon, and that's kind of northwest from the Galilee region where Jesus usually worked. And the same story is told in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 15, and the woman is described as a Canaanite woman. That means she's a descendant of people who were already in the land when the Israelites invaded it. When Joshua led them into the promised land, she's a non-Jewish outsider. All right, so you've got the context now. And this outsider woman sought out Jesus, who's a Jewish rabbi, teacher, and begged him to heal her daughter. It says in the Bible that she had an unclean spirit. Um, maybe this meant mental illness. Maybe it meant epilepsy. It's probably just something that they, they didn't understand at the time. And Jesus responds in a way that seems really harsh. He said, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it through the, to the dogs. saying that he came to the Jews first. But this story appears in the Bible to explain that the church welcomed Gentiles, non-Jews, and it also it parallels how the Apostle Paul spoke first to the Jews and then went on to proclaim the good news to, that the kingdom of God is here to non-Jewish people. You remember your stories about Apostle Paul? He traveled all over the known world, and, and he didn't talk too much to Jews at that point. He was seeking out people that were not of the Jewish faith. These stories are illustrated that participation in the kingdom of God is based on faith. And so the faith of that woman is contrasted with the unbelief of the, the, that Jesus found in many of the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. We talked about that element last week quite a bit. So um, if you're reading along in the gospel, read all of chapter 7 together and you'll see this uh, compare and contrast of the people's faith and what they did. So and I think to fully understand the barrier between Jews and Gentiles, we have to look um, not only at that strange history of the Israelites, coexisting in Gentile land. Remember I said Canaanites were in the land first? But also in this region, it's a socioeconomic fact that the Jewish people were mostly peasant farmers. And so they produced the food for the wealthy uh, Gentiles in cities like Tyre. All right, so think about that a little bit. In times when there was famine or crisis, I think that the, probably the Jewish farmers could have resented that the food that they produced was going to those rich Gentiles instead of to their own children. Galilee itself was largely a Gentile region with the Jewish population in the minority. So hostility and prejudice existed on both sides. Are you starting to get the context that this story is framed in? 
is it ringing any bells with what we're dealing with in our lives and what's been in the news today? Got any hostility, any prejudice? My family's from St. Louis, and so it's in the news every day what happened in Ferguson and how they, they deal with it. But we, we have to deal with this in our own lives as well. This is not a new problem, is what I'm saying to you. That people throw up barriers and divisions. <clears throat> well, all these barriers, they made it really hard for this Gentile woman to approach a Jewish teacher for help. The title of my message is, Speaking Up is Hard to Do Sometimes. And maybe that, that means something to you. But in this case, it, it, have you ever had a hard time speaking up for something that you know is right? Either in your own personal life or in your family or in your workplace or in the world. Speaking up is hard to do sometimes. So this, this, this woman answered Jesus boldly. I love this answer. She said, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus re replied that because of her excellent argument, the demon had left her child. And in Matthew's Gospel, says, uh, Jesus says, the woman's faith, because of her faith, her daughter was healed. But my friends, I think that the real miracle may go beyond this healing in this individual case. See, by the time that Mark told the story, 60 years or so after Jesus lived, and died and rose. Sixty years of people trying to get along to understand what it means to be people of faith, to follow Jesus. The dogs under the table were part of the Christian family. So what he was really doing was challenging Jewish Christians to re-examine how they treated Gentiles. So I know. We don't speak Greek or Aramaic, and we lose some of the cleverness of this reply in the translation. This woman is definitely an outsider in Jesus' world, and so she has to come, overcome the barriers of religion and culture and economic status and language and gender, and, and yet she boldly answers the, the, the teacher who tests her. Sometimes our tests in our life come from unexpected places. And I pray that we have the boldness and the courage to speak up for what is right. So let me just tell you that the word that Jesus used for dogs connotes mangy mutts who are scavenging and begging for scraps. Have you seen any mangy mutts? running around town. Well, the persistent mother, this is where the cleverness comes in. She flips this argument around and she uses a different word for dog. She uses the word for beloved family pet. I ask the children if they have a dog, how, how many of you out there have a beloved family pet? Maybe a little lap dog that you... Uh, put bows in its hair or something like that. Um, I had a beagle and he's gone to live with my son and, and his girlfriend. And just about every week, Ellie sends me a picture of my dog in a little pink scarf. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing to him in Minnesota, but anyway, he's a beloved man to pet. <laughs> okay, so he's, now that you start to see the, the, the cleverness and the, the faithfulness, the boldness of this woman, because she uses a different word for dog. The Aramaic language has different words that have different connotations. And we can imagine that people love their family pets then, just as we do now. So Jesus applauds her clever answer. And he applauds her faith, and he applauds her perseverance, as she, and he declares that her daughter is healed. So I don't want us to miss the significance of Jesus granting a request of a Gentile woman. See, God's mighty works happen to non-Jewish people as well as to Jews. This expansion of Jesus' ministry 
was at times challenging for him. I love this story. Because we also can find ourselves challenged when God works in ways outside of our understanding. Okay, the second part of our gospel reading tells about a deaf man who was made to hear. And I, was, I wondered if he was like an elderly man that I know who went to his doctor about his hearing loss. And the doctor prescribed a tiny little hearing aid. And it essentially cured the man's deafness. So a few weeks later, the, the, the man goes back to his doctor uh, for a checkup. And the doctor asks the man, hey, I bet your family is thrilled that you can hear again. Well, I didn't tell him, the man said. I just sit around and listen. And so far, I've changed my will three times. <laughs> After Jesus healed the daughter of the, the Syrophoenician woman, he left the, the region of Tyre and he went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee. And then Mark tells the story of some people who bring a deaf man to Jesus and they beg him to heal him. What made these people bring a deaf man who could hardly speak to Jesus? and beg him to just place his hand on him. It was faith. It was not faith as a theoretical conviction or faith as a creed recited, but it was faith in person, faith in Jesus' compassion and in his ability. And Jesus healed the man. His hearing was restored. He was cured of his speech impediment. I love what Jesus did. He took the man aside in private. And he put his fingers in his ears. I think that, that helped the guy to know, just kind of communicate his healing. And then Jesus spat and touched his tongue. I'm not going to demonstrate that part for you. But let me just say that saliva was thought to have healing properties. And Jesus looked up to heaven and he said, Uvatha, be opened. Congratulations to Al for trying that Aramaic word. It was very weird for us to hear a different kind of word. Ufatha, be opened. I think Jesus' elaborate steps to heal this man help to affirm that God has power over human infirmities, over diseases. Now it's clear that God is at work in Jesus. Because this man who could not speak plainly and couldn't hear, now hears and speaks. Now, do you wonder why they left that weird Aramaic word in our Bible? That Ufatha? It's a healing word. I think it enhances the miraculous aspect of, of this event. Um, I also appreciate that the writer tried to preserve some of the actual words that Jesus used, the expressions that he used, and it enhances that feeling of, of power in the healing. So I want us to learn this word, Ufatha. I want you to say it, Ufatha, Ufatha, and it means be opened. So say it like you mean it, Ufatha, Ufatha, be opened. Oh, you guys are good. All right, friends, I want you to think about Ufatha, be opened. What does it mean that the good news is open to people of all races? The story of a certain Gentile woman who sought healing for her daughter tells us so. Ufatha, be opened. Can the good news of Jesus Christ be limited by geography? No. Not in Jesus' day and not in ours. Ufatha, be opened. Are you getting the idea that this good news is for everyone? It cannot be limited by race or gender or economic status. Ufatha, be opened. It, it can't be limited. We can't pick and choose who we have in our church. Ufatha, be opened. If we believe in Jesus, that we know that boundaries are erased inside and out. That that faith in Jesus Christ 
is for us all. That good news is for everyone. I like to say that Jesus works in unexpected places with unexpected people. Re remember that man in, in Mark's Gospel? Before Jesus unlocked his tongue, he had to open his ears. Only when that guy had heard a message did he have anything to say. And so it is for most of us. We cannot share with others what we have not found ourselves. If we have not heard the good news, then we've got nothing to say about it. We cannot teach what we have not heard. We cannot articulate a truth to others that we have not appropriated in our own lives. Remember I said speaking up is hard to do sometimes. This is what Jesus Christ does for us. Christ can restore spiritual hearing and cure spiritual deafness. He makes our minds and our hearts more sensitive to the voices of God and of the world. That's why I began this worship service the way I did, talking about what is going on in the world. And then Jesus cures our speech impediments, whatever holds us back. He sets us free to, to praise God with new voices and new energies. Don't you wish we sang like the Gaither vocal band? We're getting there. We're getting there. We are free to praise God with new voices and new energies. Jesus brings us into a place of blessing, and persistent faith is powerful. Well, my friends, did you know that the population of the United States is increasing? But church membership remains the same or even drops. What that means is that the percentage of Christians in our nation is slowly decreasing. I like to say that most people come to church because somebody invited them. It doesn't have to be an elaborate invitation. It's a personal invitation. Some of you all are here today because somebody invited you. Maybe somebody said, hey, I'll come by and pick you up and bring you. So I want, and I'm, well, let me tell you, as we go through the week and people come and talk to me, they tell me more and more, hey, I invited somebody. I invited so-and-so. Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I've been praying about this. I'm inviting people. Oh, friends, that just brings joy to my heart. And we see the results here in our church. Let me recall you to the story of the man who was deaf and mute. He was healed because he was brought to Christ. We don't know why he didn't come by himself. But I will tell you that there are people all around us in Trent, Missouri, if we say, why don't you come to church? They say, well, I've never been asked. Who is there in your life, somebody you already know, that you can be given a friendly invitation to, to come to church? Who is there in your wide social circle that can honestly say that they've never been asked to a worship service? Never been asked to meet Jesus Christ, the creator and savior of the world. So this Labor Day weekend, a lot of us uh, enjoy a vacation, a rest from our work, a rest from our labors. But we need to remind ourselves that Jesus is always working. God is always working in the world. Jesus will never take a vacation as long as there are people who need it. He's looking for people who are hurting, people who are lonely, people who are bound by addictions of every kind. And he's telling them, come to me. I can help you. I can help you today. We can be like that man's friends and invite somebody to come to know Jesus. Let us pray. Oh, Holy One, divine healer, we praise you. You have the power to open eyes and to unstop ears and to unleash tongues. And God, we confess that we are blind and deaf and mute in many ways. 
We walk past the poor and the lonely, the homeless with indifferent eyes. We don't listen to, with love to everyone at all times. We confess that speaking up is hard to do and that not everything that comes out of our mouths is, is prayer or praise or proclaiming the good news. So God, we pray to experience your healing on our lives. We pray that you uncover our eyes so that we can see your glory and see your people all around us. Unstop our ears so that we can clearly hear your voice. Unleash our tongues so that we can enthusiastically spread the good news. And we pray for healing in body and in mind and in spirit for your work in the world. In Jesus' name.